let's start with some uh, you know like easy definitions oh kubernetes is a container management system well thank you captain obvious uh, we can use it to manage containerized apps on a cluster okay that these are great you know dictionary style definitions but what does that really mean so <clears throat> um i I'm a big fan of Python and one thing I like in Python is this concept of duct typing. So it's called duct typing because we say if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And so what that means is that if you have a, a viable f and you can do um, f.read, f.write, f.close, then f is probably a file. Uh, it's the same concept as what we have with interfaces in Go or Java, for instance. You know, you, 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 you define a thing by the operations that you can do on that thing. So I'm going to try and do that with Kubernetes. I'm going to uh, try to, uh, to, to, to tell us like, what we can do with Kubernetes as a way to, to define it. So let's say that I have <clears throat> uh, an, an, an e-commerce application um, and I'm selling stuff there. And so I have a web front end. The web front end is talking to an internal API and the API then connects to a database. And at first, um, I'm going to decide that the database will stay outside of Kubernetes because I've read uh, some stuff on like, you know, uh, developer.com or whatever that was saying, oh, databases on Kubernetes are so complicated. So I decided to leave my databases outside of Kubernetes. Maybe I'm using Heroku Postgres or maybe I'm using uh, RDS or whatever managed database. I don't know. But anyway, for now, the databases are outside. So the step one, um, if I want to deploy that app on Kubernetes, the step one is to uh, create some container images. Uh, and that kind of came as a surprise a few years ago when I started to teach Kubernetes. It was in the beginning of the hype cycle and I had some customers who were telling me, all right, I want to move my stuff to Kubernetes. I'm like, okay, fine, let's let's look at that. Um, do you have container images? And they're like, container what? Images? Why do I need that? I'm like, well, if you want to run something on Kubernetes, you need a container image. If you don't have a container image, you won't be able to run it on Kubernetes. And then after talking a little bit with them, we realized that they had no idea what a container was. So I'm like, okay, you know what? We're going to do the Kubernetes training in six months. We're going to start with a Docker training uh, and help you to get familiar with containers and images and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So let's pretend uh, that we have uh, maybe written some Docker files and built some images. Uh, and um, now we have a way to get the app uh, up and running locally. It could be with Docker and Compose, it could be with something else that doesn't matter, but you know, you have your application up and running in containers locally. Then, only then we can start talking about Kubernetes. So what we're gonna do is that we will, we will tell uh, Kubernetes, uh, start a bunch of containers running the image uh, for that internal API. Now put an internal load balancer uh, so that I have, you know, like a, a, an internal load balancer to connect to my internal API. Now we do the same for the web front end. So I want a bunch of containers uh, with uh, my web front end and I want a public load balancer uh, for these containers. Um, after that, uh, let's say that there is a, a surge in traffic. Um, just a couple of weeks ago in the US, it was Thanksgiving. And just after Thanksgiving, there is Black Friday, which is the, 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 the big consumerism party where everybody tries to buy that they don't need. Um, so very often on e-commerce websites, you have huge spikes uh, in traffic. Um, and it's not just in the US, like there is something equivalent uh, in, in China. Um, and each time um, Alibaba like, uh, publishes like record numbers of like, oh, we made like that many billions of 
revenue for, for this thing. Um, same thing around Christmas for folks who celebrate Christmas because very often they want to buy gifts to other people. So again, huge spike of traffic. So in that case, I will probably need to scale up uh, my application. Uh, so instead of five containers for my API, maybe I need 50. And instead of 10 for the front end, maybe I need 25. So Kubernetes will help me to do that. We will see that with just a single command, I can tell Kubernetes, give me 30 containers for, for that stuff. Uh, now, in the middle of that, you know, at, at the moment when I'm making the most revenue in the year, I realize I have a bug in my web front end. Uh, and I realize that when people put multiple things in the shopping cart and they check out, there is only one item that checks out. So I'm like, oh, that's really bad because I'm losing a lot of revenue there. So I need to fix that bug but I want to do it as smoothly as possible. I don't want to take down the whole site and deploy the new version and bring everything back up. No, I want to do one of these rolling updates that I was mentioning earlier, replace the containers one by one. Um, and so what I do in that case, uh, I'm, I, I'm going to tell Kubernetes, <clears throat> replace, that container and it will automatically automatically take care uh, of doing that that rolling update for me um, now this is kind of our basic uh, list of things we can do auto scaling auto scaling means that uh, instead of me manually deciding how many containers i want i'm going to <clears throat> tell kubernetes make sure that the average CPU usage in these containers is above that, um, about that many percent and Kubernetes will automatically scale up if there is a spike in traffic. So for instance, if I'm selling uh, delicious kombucha and suddenly uh, there is some very famous Instagram influencer with millions of followers who like sends a picture like drinking my kombucha and I have like millions of people who want to buy my kombucha online, uh, I have a spike in traffic. And so instead of uh, my monitoring system waking me up because everything is through the roof, Kubernetes will automatically scale up so that I don't even need to wake up. And instead of waking up with an incident, I wake up the day after with good news because I had tons and tons of orders and revenue, great. So that's auto-scaling. Uh, it also works in the other direction in the sense that once the traffic spike is gone, Kubernetes will scale down uh, my resources as well so that I don't uh, keep uh, giving money to my, uh, well, so that I don't keep giving too much money to my cloud provider. Kubernetes is also going to play Tetris. Uh, what do I mean by that? I suppose you know Tetris, the game with the, the, the pieces and you try to make lines and when you make a full line, it disappears. So Kubernetes is going to do that, but um, the, the pieces are basically my containers um, and uh, it's trying to fit my containers on my cluster as efficiently as possible. So for instance, if I have a bunch of containers uh, needing a lot of CPU, a bunch of containers needing a lot of RAM, it's going to try to put them together so that I maximize resource utilization on my cluster. I can also give some placement constraints. For instance, I can tell Kubernetes, oh, you know what, about this database, like earlier I decided to keep the database outside, but now I changed my mind. I want to put the database on Kubernetes, but I want to have a primary and a replica, and I want to make sure that they are in different machines or zones or data centers. I can also tell Kubernetes to do that for me. We can also do some um, advanced deployment patterns um, so may maybe you've heard about blue-green and canary deployments. Uh, one example, blue-green deployments. So we talked about this last week in the Docker training, but a blue-green deployment, this is when, uh, when you want to deploy a new version of your stack, instead of replacing each component one by one, no, what you do is that you deploy a complete uh, version. So you have the, 
the blue stack. So conceptually, imagine it's a bunch of it's a bunch of servers that I have here. That's the blue stack. And now, if I want to deploy the new version, I create the green stack here. So I have a bunch of machines with the, the new version. Uh, I test everything, and and when I'm ready, I switch traffic over from the blue stack to the green stack. Conceptually, it's like as if I had a network cable and I unplug from the blue stack, plug into the green stack and done. So uh, this has multiple advantages. One of the advantages is that if I realize after a few minutes or a few hours that I messed up and that the green stack has some pretty critical bug or performance regression or whatever, instead of panicking and having to roll back individually each service. I'm like, no, nope, no problem. We just get the network cable and we plug it back into the blue stack and we can analyze the situation and see what happens. Now, of course, uh, in the real world, we don't do blue-green deployment by plugging network cables. We do that by reconfiguring load balancers and we will see that Kubernetes helps us to do that. Now, um, this is a really interesting example because Kubernetes does not have a blue-green command. You know, we, can't, we cannot do like kubectl, blue-green, blah, blah, blah. But Kubernetes is giving us tools to make it easier to implement blue-green deployments. Um, I usually compare that to, <clears throat> you know, let, let's say you want to build some... Uh, uh, some furniture from Ikea or whatever. So you have your bookshelves and your table and your chairs, etc. Uh, you can either do it by hand or you could use an electric uh, drill and power tools, etc. Well, Kubernetes is going to be the electric drill and power tools, etc. Kubernetes will make it easier uh, to build these things uh, instead of doing that manually.